This morning, I want to declare to you the best news I could possibly give you. If I had just one opportunity to share one bit of good information with you, this would be it. If I was given just one message to give for the rest of my life, and it could only be one, it would be this message. You, whoever you are, and whatever you've done, wherever your life has taken you to this point, wherever you come from, you can be reconciled to God. That is the best possible news in the world, that you yourself, often in spite of you, even though God knows everything about you, can be reconciled to God. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.20 in the second part tells us this. It's the challenge that Paul gave the church at Corinth. It's the resounding challenge of the New Testament. It's the challenge that God gives to you today. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, if I were sharing that statement, if I just stood up, say, in an arena somewhere, uh, maybe at a baseball game, maybe in a, an NBA conference finals and said to thousands of people, I've got good news for you today, you can be reconciled to God. That might fall on deaf or unappreciative ears for the vast majority of people. It would be sort of like me walking up to you and saying something like this, um, Bob, have you, have, you, have you made up with your wife yet? Have you been reconciled with your wife? And your response might be, well, I, I'm not aware there's a problem. I mean, I think I think we're okay, unless you know something I don't know. I mean, I think we're pretty good. For the vast majority of people who've ever considered the issue, there are probably far too many of them who don't think there's even an issue. Me and God are okay. You know, I, I, me and the man upstairs, you know, we, we're fine. We don't need to be, be reconciled. But the Bible tells us something so different. The very promise of that beautiful truth that you can be reconciled to God presupposes that every single one of us, every single person, everywhere, needs to be reconciled. And if we're not reconciled, the consequences of being unreconciled to God are tragic and they're eternal. If we choose not to accept the offer of God in Christ for reconciliation, we lose everything. Romans chapter 5 is a beautiful passage about what God has done for us in Christ to reconcile us and also simultaneously why we so desperately need it. Speaking to Christians, Paul writes in Romans 5, 1 this, he says, since we have been justified with God through faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. Now, maybe you're sitting here today and have no particular faith or a very shaky or uncertain faith. Or maybe an awareness that you really don't have faith at all. But at the same time, you're not aware that you have any issue with God, any conflicts there. Because there seems to be relative peace in your life. I mean, there's not chaos, at least not any different sort of chaos than you become accustomed to. You, you don't sense any oppression from God or punishment from God. You don't feel like you're under the thumb of God or under the heel of God. You say, I think I'm okay with God. There's peace. But the rest of Romans chapter 5 describes a very different scene for us. Starting in verse 6, it says, we were weak. Doesn't mean physically. Weak, spiritually, incapable, unable. If you decided today on your own, okay, on your own, apart from Christ, but with the best effort that you've got, with all the good intention that you can muster, that today I'm going to turn my life around. Today I'm going to, I'm going to start, I'm going to start a, a new chapter I'm going to be better than I've been, and I'm going to be good enough for God. You can't. You don't have it. We're weak. The Bible also describes us that we were ungodly. We were still sinners, verse 8, but yet Christ died for us. And he says this in verse 8 of Romans chapter 5. God showed his love for us in that. In our sinful state, Christ died for us. And then he says, since we've been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Simply because you may feel this sort of general peace right now in your life, this absence of obvious conflict, does not mean that there's not a future wrathful response to sin that's coming. Because God is just. And every single person, as we've seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, is going to die and face judgment. 
And that judgment will be pure and unfiltered. That judgment will be equally applied to all. And every single person will face that judgment with a penalty to be paid. And the only question will be, will I face it and pay the penalty myself, or will I face it with the penalty paid already by Christ? So Romans 5.10 says, we were enemies, but now we're, we're reconciled. Through Christ, we've received reconciliation. So what about you today? What if you've not received it? What if you've not been reconciled? What if you're still guilty before God? And what if you have to stand before God who's perfect and just and holy and all-knowing, and God must deal with you according to your sins? What then? Let me tell you how you can be reconciled today. And it's the... It's the most succinct and beautiful statement of the gospel that you'll find in this second letter to the Corinthians. Because here's what God has done for us. For our sake, he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, that's Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. How can a sinful person be made right with a sinless God? How can a person who has sinned both in thought and in attitude, in words and in actions, how is a person who's done all these things and now can't undo them be made right with a God who demands holiness? The Scripture says, for without it, without that holiness, none of us will see God, no one. So how can you reconcile those two things? Our sinfulness, God's holiness, Only in Christ. Because God imputed to Christ our sin. He counted our sins against him. And he imputed to us Christ. He counted his righteousness for us. This this is the good news. This is the gospel. Not to be shared. That's a phrase we use a lot. We need to be sharing the gospel. This is the good news to simply be declared. It's a truth that needs to be told again and again and again and again. We are separated from God because of our sins, but God in Christ is willing to reconcile because he's done this for us. So how can you be reconciled today? You have to recognize. You have to recognize that Christ is the remedy to that condition. Your sin before God has made you his enemy. It's made you weak and unable to save yourself. It's created for you an everlasting debt, but Christ is the remedy for that. He's the remedy for that condition because he took on sin. But it goes beyond that. Reconciliation takes repentance. Repentance is not only the recognition of your need for the remedy of Christ, but your heartfelt response in turning from that sin and turning to Christ. It's repentance. We repent of our sin. We turn from it and turn to Christ. Save me from this. When you do that, you receive grace. You receive God's grace. Grace is all the goodness of God given to us through Christ. Every good thing God wants to do in your life given to you through Christ. And that's reconciliation. That's why we sing the songs that we have sung. That's why they they resonate with you, right? That's why the old hymns stir something up in your heart because they speak of reconciliation. That's why you stand to your feet moved by a song that speaks of the work of Christ for us, because we know this to be true. So you're saying maybe, why would you share a message like that, besides the obvious point that it's in the text that we're on, with a congregation full of people who are presumably Christian? I mean, for goodness sakes, it's, it's Memorial Day weekend. If anybody's at church on Sunday morning on Memorial Day weekend, it must be a Christian, Right? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, then surely speaks to us. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, that's a tough, that's a tough verse. That's a troubling one. And Paul's laid out the premise here, right? You can be reconciled to God. You can't do it on your own. You don't have that ability. 
This is not about good works and good intentions. This is not undoing bad with more good and tilting the scales in your favor. You can be reconciled to God because God has done the amazing. He's done what seems to be to us the impossible. He's done the everlasting act of grace given to us in Christ. I mean, he put our sins on him and put his righteousness on us. He's made that possible. If you receive it, he offers it. It's called grace. But he says this, and here's, here's the challenge, the earnest appeal to us. Don't receive this grace in vain. I want us to pray about that this morning and what that means and how we can be sure, sure and certain today that's not us. Father, you alone have the keys to our heart. You alone can soften it, penetrate it, change it. Father, you alone direct the thoughts of man. You, you alone, Father, know us completely and totally, yet love us incomprehensibly. Um, so, Father, I'm entrusting your word into your hands so that your spirit accomplishes your purpose among these people today. And may we respond rightly. So hit us where we think and where we feel. What we do and where we live. Father, show us your way, and I pray we'd walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. What does he mean when he says, don't receive the grace of God in vain? Let's take the first phrase there for a second. When Paul's referencing the grace of God here, is he talking about this? Is he talking about, um, is he talking about the way that God forgives us only? Is he talking about God's goodness for us uh, generically? Or is it something bigger? I think we could rightly look at this in its context as we take chapter 5 and the remainder of chapter 6, which we'll do later. I think if we look at this in its context, we would rightly deduce that when he says the grace of God, it's shorthand for salvation in general. Salvation in general. Here's the message of salvation, the gospel itself. When he talks about, I don't want you to receive the grace of God, he's talking about the good news of Christ, this, this message of reconciliation, because that's, that's the gospel. That's what makes the gospel good news, is that you can be reconciled. And so when he says this grace of God, he's talking about the gospel and all of its benefits. In chapter 5 and verse 16, he speaks of the new attitude we have in Christ. We don't see people the same way. In verse 17, he talks about the new creation of Christ. We are not the same as we used to be, but we've been changed from the inside. We're new creations. He talks about our reconciliation in 18 and 19 and our responsibility to share that reconciliation with other people. In verse 21, he talks about the righteousness we have received, which is, which is not just our standing before God one day in the future, but it's who we are today, that I'm not the same person I used to be. God's changed my heart and changed my desires and put in me a desire to walk with him, to be pleasing him in every way. And all of this is wrapped up in the word that you see as salvation in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Quoting Isaiah 49, here's what he says. For he says, God says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Using an Old Testament reference, God said, when a favorable time came, I heard your prayers and I saved you, I delivered you. And Paul takes that case study of God's deliverance of a whole nation of a people in Israel and compares it to salvation today for a person, for an individual, for me, for you. When is the time that God says is favorable? When is that time where God will save you? Now. Right now. As you hear this message, you can be reconciled to God. You can be. For what God has done for you in Christ is more than sufficient. You can be. And, and when should you respond to that message? Now. Now. You know, today, is, today is Senior Adult Sunday. We recognize our senior adults. I'm going to do a quick survey. How many of our senior adults in this room would say that you have been a follower of Christ, you trusted Christ as your Savior, you've been a follower of Christ for over 40 years? Will you stand? If you've been a Christian for over 40 years, will you stand up? Okay, 
How about over 50 years? Stay standing. Over 50 years you've been a follower of Christ. I won't go much higher than that because I don't want to like spoil your age number that you've been hiding from, from your kids and stuff. Please sit down. The faithfulness of people who follow Christ for a long time. Here's a troubling trend for you, though. I wonder how many people are putting it off until they're senior adults to follow Christ. I'll do that later. I'll do that when I get old. I'll settle my affairs, as it were, as if we're talking about your insurance or your stocks or your will. And you're putting it off, and you're putting it off, and you think there's a better time coming, a future time coming, when I'm not so young, when I don't have other things I want to be about and doing. Believing the deluding lie of the enemy, there's always time, there's always more time, there's always more time. And yet when no one expects it, life could end in a flash. So what's the appropriate day of salvation if you're not saved? Is it when you're 50 or 70 or 85? The appropriate time is now. It's right now. Right now, today. Today is the day. So he says, I want you to not receive this grace of God in vain. And I think the key to understanding that whole phrase, that whole verse, this whole text, is the word vain. In vain. We see the same word, the same word from the Greek, the same word translated to in vain several other times in the New Testament. Galatians 2.2 2, he ta Paul talks about not running the race in vain. I wanted to make sure I wasn't running this race called life in vain. In Philippians 2.16, he says, I had to hold fast to the Scriptures, the words of life, so I could be proud that I didn't run this race in vain or labor in vain. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5, he says, I, I wanted to hear about your faith because I wanted to be sure that you were not laboring in vain. Typically, what this word means is, is to be empty, like without content, without result, without effect. So to receive God's grace in vain may not mean simply to reject it or neglect it. But what about those people in the Corinthian church, and what about the people in the Calvary church, and so many churches like us today, who claim to be Christian They lay claim to being children of God saved by grace, and yet the grace of God never attains its goal in their life. It doesn't seem to be achieving its purpose. It seems to be of no effect. In other words, those people who say for whatever reasons they believe it to be so that they're saved, yet there's no evidence of that salvation at work and play in their life at all. It seems to be in, in vain. There, there's something lacking. And the obvious question this begs for all of us is this, is the gospel, this, when I say the gospel, I don't, want to think, I don't want you to think I'm talking in some sort of religious code. Has the fact that Christ has taken on your sin and given you his righteousness, and you receive that by faith, okay, that good news, that gospel, is that having its intended effects on you? Has the old passed away? Or is it at least, is it dying every day? Or do you appear to be the same person you were before you had that profession of faith, that confession of salvation? Are you displaying righteousness? I mean, is it obvious that your life has been transformed and that now Christ rules? What about in what you want, what you long for, what you live for, what you desire, what you pursue, what you spend your time with, your money on, give your affections to? Is grace having its effect? Do you, your desires show that you desire God and what God desires? Because this is no minor warning, you see. This is something that Paul hit with every church. The Galatians, the Philippians, the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, the same challenge. that You might hear this message of the gospel, and it might not have effect. So, so what's the remedy to this? We'll see this later in the text, 
when we get to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, where we have this challenge, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Now here's my take on that. That's the sort of phrase, if I were to put that in the sort of a, maybe a little more modern vernacular there, and say something like this to you, you have a responsibility to see if you're really saved. To put your life up and the evidence that you have against the scriptures, against the gospel itself. Because if you're a Christian, Christ is in you unless you fail this test, unless the evidence tells you he doesn't and you're not. Now, that's the sort of phrase that if I were to give that to you and it was not in Scripture, most Christians I know would be offended at that. They would recoil at that. How how dare you? Who do you think you are challenging my faith? That's personal. That's private. That's between me and God. You don't know me. You don't know my heart. But since it's in Scripture and it's emphatic, How can we ignore it? How can we ignore the responsibility that each of us has to put our own life up to the test? Am I in Christ? Or is Christ in me? Because if Christ in me, there's obviously going to be some, some fruit of that, some evidence of that. Unless maybe there are some of us in this room who've embraced a false gospel. You know, a false gospel would be one like this. The purpose of God in Christ for you is simply to forgive you. If you say a prayer, if you say the right formula, then your sins will be forgiven, and no matter what you do, no matter how you live, you'll go to heaven one day. That's all it's about. We have generations of so-called and semi-Christians today who've embraced a forgiveness-only gospel. And therefore, they see following Christ, surrendering to Christ, living under the authority of Christ to be ultimately optional. It's optional because I'm good. I punched my ticket. I got my pass. I said my prayer. I've got my forgiveness in hand. But that's not a biblical gospel. Many in our culture today call themselves Christian who have embraced a a left-leaning gospel. And I use the word gospel in quotes. I just don't like doing air quotes because I think that looks ridiculous, but gospel. They've embraced a left-leaning gospel that says, to be a Christian, you just do good works. The modern-day social justice warriors among us who say Christianity is based on combating social issues. And while certainly Christ being Lord of us makes demands on how we live, that certainly saves nobody. What we're exporting to most of the rest of the world is known infamously as the prosperity gospel. In other words, if you'll accept what God's giving, He wants to give you a lot. And it's not really so much about your salvation, and it's certainly not about giving you a new king. It's about giving you stuff and making you happier and more satisfied with this life and its provisions. You know, Christ can be the means to all the things you've ever wanted, but it's not the gospel. That's linked closely with the consumer gospel. God exists just to meet my needs. What's God for? Why do we worship him? So we can get stuff from him. He exists to meet my needs. When do I pray? When I'm needy. Then there's the right-leaning gospel, the gospel of self-righteousness. What does the Bible teach? It teaches a fully-orbed kingdom gospel. Jesus is the king. He says, come and follow me. Come and follow me with your whole life. Have you accepted an insufficient gospel then? Have you accepted an insufficient gospel, a gospel that doesn't demand anything of you, that that doesn't change you, that doesn't cause you self-evaluation, right? Test yourself. Maybe a better phrase would be this, are you living an emaciated gospel? I mean, you're there, you're, you're alive and breathing, But man, you ought to be better than that. You ought not be so spiritually poor as that, so spiritually weak as that, because the gospel calls us to more. It calls us to abundant life, 
Abundant life. I'll give you abundant life, Jesus says. These are ideas behind receiving the gospel in vain, the gospel of Christ that changes everything for us, everything, that invites Christ to rule in every way in us. Well, there's some implications for this if you're a Christian. Paul's challenge here. I mean, the first is a great good news, right? You can be reconciled. The second is how you can be reconciled. The third is the warning to understand what this grace of God is intended for and to do. Consider what he says in verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way. This is a message to Christians here in this room. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, and the Holy Spirit. Genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We're treated as impostors, yet we're true. As unknown, and yet we're well known. As dying, and behold, we live. As punished, and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You're not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Let me give you these implications for a moment this morning for Christians in this room. Because people can be reconciled to God. And because there is a danger of a gospel that's insufficient, we're weak, or even non-saving, we have to make sure that we don't do anything that diminishes the gospel. We have to be careful that we don't diminish the gospel. He says we don't put obstacles in people's path. There is one huge obstacle in the path of anybody receiving Christ. One huge obstacle. Pride. The pride that says, I can save myself or I don't need saving. This huge obstacle that says the cross shows you the seriousness of your sin and the heinousness of it before God and the necessary response of that, the cost of it. No, the gospel itself has enough of an obstacle. It's the cross. It's the cross. But often as Christians, we're putting so many other many obstacles before they ever get to the cross. How we live, how we talk, how we post on social media, how we choose lesser things over greater things, how we'd rather be political than spiritual, or how we're better baseball fans than we are Christian worshipers, or how we're much more about career than we are about Christ. Or how even thinking we're doing the ultimate, we put our families first. We put Christ first. We diminish the gospel. When the gospel doesn't transform us, when the gospel doesn't become something that drives us in how we live, we've diminished its worth. We've said to the world around us, you know what, it's good to have it because just in case it's true, just in case this whole heaven-hell equation is real, it's good to know you got this in your back pocket. It's a diminished gospel. We also have to be certain to demonstrate the gospel. You demonstrate it by persevering. The gospel is put on beautiful display when it costs you something to follow Christ. Or when life is painful and yet you follow Christ nonetheless. Or in how you handle hurts through great endurance. He says, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, none of those deterred him from following Christ. I have a note written in one of my Bibles. It's a small Bible I used to use when I was um, in student ministry, and I would speak at different student ministry events. And something I'd written in a student ministry conference, enough of importance to me that I put in pen at the front of my Bible, character is knowing What does it take to stop you? 
It, what does it take to stop you? What, what would it take to deter you from following Christ? What would it take for you to give up? And say, I'm not doing it anymore. It's not worth it. I'm too let down. I'm too disappointed in God. I'm too hurt. I'm too frustrated. It costs too much. What would it take? So there's perseverance. You demonstrate the gospel when you follow Christ regardless. But you also demonstrate the gospel when you follow Christ in power. Power. I'm not talking about supernatural activity that someone would say, wow, you're a miracle worker. I'm talking about the supernatural activity that says, look at what God has done in you. You're not who I used to know. You're not the person you used to be. What's the power of the gospel in a Christian that shows this is real? How about this? Purity. I don't live like I used to live. I say no to things I used to embrace. Because Christ is in me and Christ is pure, he yearns for purity in me. Or knowledge, or patience, or kindness, or the evidence of the Holy Spirit in me, or, or genuine love, love that does something, not just says something. Truthful speech, the power of God, weapons of righteousness. Maybe that's an Ephesians 6 reference. I have, I have the tools now to live righteously. All this is the evidence. God is doing something in me that's making me every day look more and more like Jesus. That says the gospel. And Paul says, as a Christian, demonstrate power. You know, I also have to be constant as Christians in declaring the gospel. This is not just sharing it, okay? This is not just telling your story. This is not just giving a testimony. Let me tell you what God did for me. That's great. Those are great segues into declaring the gospel. Telling people what God did for you in Christ and when you discovered him and what you did in response to what you discovered is a great segue into declaring the gospel. And the declaration of the gospel is the statement of this truth. You can be reconciled to God, and here's how. God wants you to be reconciled to him, and here's how. Here's what you can do today to be reconciled. No, no, not can be. It's a command. Be. Be reconciled. That's a declaration. Let me tell you the good news. Be reconciled to God. Remember at the end of chapter 5, we're given our life purpose. Not our job, not our occupation, but our purpose. As those who have received reconciliation, be ministers of reconciliation. You're an ambassador of Christ. He says in verse 11 of this chapter, we have spoken freely to you. Our heart is wide open. I've opened up my heart to you. I've not held anything back. I've spoken to you the truth from my heart. Real Christians do that. People profoundly affected by the gospel do that. They open up their heart to other people and they speak the truth plainly to them. If you're not a Christian yet, there's one implication in all of this text that we've read and considered today for you. One. Just one. It's found in the second part of verse 2. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Here's, here's what you've got to do. You've got to decide what you're going to do with the gospel. Why you still can. If you're not a Christian yet, you've got to decide what you're going to do with this gospel not receive it in vain, not give lip service to it, but to embrace it Why you still can. You say, well, what do you mean by why you still can? I, I have free choice. I can do this anytime I want to. I don't have to do it today. I don't have to do it now. I can do it whenever I want to. Are you so sure? Because there are many factors that go into that choosing of Christ for salvation. What about if there never comes another time where you want to? What about if your heart's never drawn to this again? What if there doesn't come another time where Christ is pulling you and drawing you? Or what if you don't have any more time? And there's so many factors, but here's what you do know. If you feel the pull of Christ today, you hear the draw of this message to you today, you can be reconciled to God. You can be at peace with God. You can be made right with God. Here's how. Today is the day of salvation. Then I can assure you that today is a day of salvation for you. I can't guarantee tomorrow, nor can you, or even 20 years from now, should you live that long. But you've got to decide what you're going to do with the gospel. 
for all of us in this room who named Jesus as Savior, we've got to examine ourselves. Are we in? Or better yet, is He in us? Put it to the test. Have we received this gospel in vain? Have we heard it but not responded to it? Have we grown indifferent or callous to it? Have we accepted several subpar, inferior, non-biblical versions of it that may leave us in eternal jeopardy? Will we join the company of the Matthew chapter 7s? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, I went to church all the time, even on Memorial Day weekend. I gave offering, even that special thing they did for retired pastors. I was in a life group. I taught. I even volunteered in the nursery, for goodness sake. I went on a mission trip twice. Didn't I do all these things? Depart from me. I never knew you. Is Christ in us? Is the gospel having its effect in us as he intends? If you're not a Christian yet, what are you going to do? Behold, now is a favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. You can be reconciled to God today. And being reconciled to God today is permanent. Once reconciled to God in Christ, you will never be unreconciled. And no one is irreconcilable. You can be reconciled. Because all of your sin was put on Christ. And he's willing to give you all of his righteousness in return. And he is a far better Savior than you are a sinner. And today is your day of salvation if you'll accept it. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray your will be done today in the lives of us all. That you would call some Christians in this room for, to careful, serious evaluation of their life, their walk, their desires, the, the fruit, the evidence of the transforming work of the gospel in their life. If they have not run in vain, labored in vain, if they've not received your grace in vain, Father, it may not be true of any of us. If there's anyone here yet to respond to or receive the promise, the gift, the hope of reconciliation, sins forgiven, life changed, eternity guaranteed, Father, I pray that today they would believe your good news, that your Holy Spirit would hit their hearts and their minds and draw them to you today. And they would say, yes, I want to be reconciled to you, God. I want this today. I want Jesus. I want his forgiveness. I want the new life that's promised. I want the hope of heaven. And I want the power of your Holy Spirit in me, changing me, make me a new person. Father, call some to reconciliation today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.